Born in Fort Worth, Texas, drummer Taylor Hawkins was the youngest of three siblings, having a mother and a father who seemed like polar opposites. According to Rolling Stone, he would describe his father as, and I quote, stony coldness typical of a 70s man, while his mother was, and I quote, full of love, sweetness, and tenderness, and the total opposite of my dad. His mother encouraged Taylor to become a musician. His family would relocate to Laguna Beach when he was just five years old. Hawkins would tell BBC that at the age of 10, he had a neighbor who had an old drum kit and beat up guitars, and by this point in his life, he didn't really excel at anything, including academics and sports. He would admit that he initially wanted to play guitar, but it seemed like too much work for him, and his neighbor encouraged him instead to try the drums. After observing Hawkins play, he would tell him, and I quote, you're a drummer. It was around this time that a female friend of Hawkins would see her brother shipped off to the army. He would leave behind his record collection, something Taylor soon found himself going through. One of the first records that caught Taylor's attention was Queen's News of the World. He would tell BBC, what I really liked as a kid besides the pop music on the radio was the Star Wars soundtrack and the Superman soundtracks and you know all the John Williams stuff, and I was emotionally drawn to those soundtracks as a kid, and I think there was something in Queen that had that cinematic approach. His mother would take him to his first concert as a child, which happened to also be Queen. Hawkins soon became a fan of other groups, including The Police, Black Sabbath, Yes, Genesis, and Rush, with Roger Taylor of Queen and Stuart Copeland of The Police being his drumming idols. He would learn to play drums by playing along to his favorite songs, by the time he reached middle school, Hawkins' life revolved around two things, music and surfing. It was during this time he would play in a variety of cover bands, and while the 80s were dominated by hair metal, Hawkins was more attracted to alternative rock including Jane's Addiction. After high school, he would relocate to Venice Beach, and even started a band called Sylvia that was heavily inspired by Jane's Addiction. Sylvia would soon find itself playing gigs at Club Lingerie, which happened to be attended by a guitarist named Stevie Salas, who was playing with Canadian artist Sass Jordan, and they just happened to be looking for a drummer to take on tour with them as they were opening for Aerosmith across Europe. Salas would tell Rolling Stone, I just showed up at Club Lingerie and there was this kind of crappy band playing, but I kept looking at the drummer and thinking, he's got this unique weird look. Something is interesting about him. I wanted a kid that really understood alternative and punk music. By this point in time, Hawkins was only 22 and was still rough around the edges, but Jordan liked that about Hawkins, telling the magazine, I knew the second he walked in the room, when somebody exudes that much love and that much light, you're drawn to them. I was like, we can work with this guy. He'd be awesome to have on the road. In 1994, while Jordan was opening for Steve Perry, and Perry's manager, Scott Welch, was also working with an up-and-coming Canadian artist named Alanis Morissette, and he took notice of the drummer. Morissette had her new album, Jagged Little Pill, that was about to come out, and they needed a drummer for the road. Hawkins would switch camps and spend the next year and a half on the road with Morissette. In December of 1995, Dave Grohl would meet Hawkins for the first time at the K-Rock Almost Acoustic Christmas concert, where both Foo Fighters and Alanis Morissette were on the bill. Grohl would recall meeting Hawkins for the first time saying, We got along like brothers from the second we met. We were best friends from that moment, with Taylor adding in the book, This is a Call. I was this little dork playing in this backup band, and the first thing that struck me was that Dave was really nice and fun to hang out with. I'd met some other people from big bands, musicians I'd looked up to. When I met them, the vibe was, oh, you're not important. Hawkins, who was a huge fan of Nirvana and Foo Fighters, noticed a camaraderie and likeness between himself and Grohl, as they smoked together and often talked about their favorite music. They would reconnect in the summer of 1996 when they played some shows together in Europe, and Hawkins would admit that Alanis Morissette predicted that he would join the Foo Fighters at that time, telling the Daily Mirror, We met the Foo Fighters when I was still playing with her, and she said, Dave Grohl's gonna ask you to join them someday. She called it a year before it happened. The following year in 1997, Foo Fighters were now without a drummer. Grohl would call up Hawkins to see if he knew any good drummers. And keep in mind, Foo Fighters were still an up-and-coming band and were nowhere near as popular as they are today. Grohl would recall that conversation with Hawkins, saying, He said, F yeah, I'll do it. I reminded him we weren't selling out stadiums like Alanis, and he said, I don't care, man. I just want to be in an effing rock band. To Hawkins, Alanis was a solo act, and he wanted to play more hard rock music. The move surprised Grohl, who told Entertainment Weekly, I thought he would never leave Alanis' band. At the time, they were packing stadiums around the world. 
And what, he's going to jump in our red Dodge van and play the and Viper Room again? He's an amazing drummer, and we have two different styles, and so he does his thing and I do my thing, and he adds so much to the songs that it's like, sometimes too much. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, that, that I think We're that totally I, can, I can see like other drummers being in the band and feeling weird and feeling intimidated and whatever, but we do two totally different things and I think we have mutual respect for each other and it's just, it's awesome. I mean, it, it works perfect, you know? And there's no, you could, you could find a better drummer. There's no way, so it works. The onboarding process for Hawkins wasn't smooth though. The first day of rehearsals, guitarist Pat Smear announced he was quitting the band, telling Grohl and company that they should consider being just a three-piece. The band was in a tough spot, having already booked a tour and having their second record, The Color and the Shape, to promote. For Smear, he was tired of life on the road and was the oldest member in the band. However, the band managed to talk the guitarist into staying for another six months until they found a replacement, which they did in Grohl's old screen bandmate Franz Stahl. Taylor's first show with Foo Fighters would happen on April 19, 1997 at a secret gig in Santa Monica at the Alligator Lounge. The band would spend the next year and a half on the road. It was following the tour for the band's second record that Grohl gave some insight into where the band's third record could go in the book This Is A Call, saying, Now I'm looking forward to our next record more than I ever have been. For a while I was thinking, God, what are we going to do for our next record? Taylor plays piano and guitar and writes songs and sings. Nate writes stuff. It's just going to be the freakout record. While the album was recorded as a three-piece, in the documentary Back and Forth, Hawkins revealed he pushed for the band to remain as a three-piece, but Grohl wanted more guitars, and so Chris Shiflett was added to the group. Taylor would play on half of the tracks on the band's third record, There Was Nothing Left to Lose, admitting it was a nerve-wracking experience telling Rolling Stone, I was so scared when we went to do Nothing Left to Lose. I had red light fever so bad. Work would begin on Foo Fighters' fourth record in August of 2000, with Grohl and Hawkins coming up with song ideas. The band would spend the remainder of the year and a good chunk of 2001 on the road. By the summer of 2001, the band hit some rough times. While on tour in the UK, Hawkins would suffer a near-fatal overdose following the band's performance at the V2001 festival. He would spend two weeks in a coma, and it would result in Foo Fighters cancelling the remainder of their tour dates. A press release was sent out by the band's management that claimed that Hawkins had, and I quote, apparently overindulged at a party following the festival performance. The drummer would express regret over his actions telling Spin Magazine in 2002, I took it too far, but thank god I did take it too far and I didn't croak, and I'm here to know how dumb I was and how lame my life had become. I was just becoming a cliched rock idiot, but I wouldn't take any of it away. None of the times I got high, not even the overdose, because I learned so much about myself through the whole thing. Once Hawkins had recovered, the band would retreat to Taylor's studio in Topanga, California to work on their fourth record, but the band wasn't getting along. In 2002, Grohl would admit to Billboard just how tense and unsuccessful those sessions were, revealing, at the time we were making an album that wasn't working. We'd started in October of 2001. After about three and a half months, I realized it didn't sound familiar. It didn't sound like the band does live. It doesn't feel right. With our band, the most important thing is that the songs feel right and the recordings feel good. It's more about feel than anything. We were so focused on production because our intent was to make this big rock record but your energy tends to wane after three months. Spontaneity and energy have a lot to do with rock, and rock records shouldn't take long to make. The Foo's fourth album would be the first time new guitarist Chris Shiflett would be in the studio with the group. He would reveal in the documentary back and forth, it was bizarre, it was my first record with the band. I just show up to the studio every day, I was sort of confused. It's really weird, I'm never really playing on this. And you know, I'd show up at noon every day, and I'd kind of sit here and eat food and drink coffee, and then I'd go home. What is this? Bassist Nate Mandel, meanwhile, would give his version of events saying, I'd do something, and Dave would listen to it, and say like, no, this has got to change, and this is not working with the vocals, and that's too busy, and I was disagreeing, so I had a shitty attitude. The band would spend time in several studios between October of 2001 and February of 2002. These sessions alone cost the band over a million dollars in production costs. By February of 2002, the band submitted their record to their manager, John Silva, who wasn't very enthusiastic about what he heard. According to Mandel, Silva said, well, we could put this out, but I don't know if we're going to be able to sell any of them. By April of 2002, Foo Fighters got an offer to perform at the Coachella Music Festival, as did Queens of the Stone Age, a band Grohl was playing in at the time. Grohl would perform one night with Queens, while the other night he would play with Foo Fighters. 
The Foos would reconvene ahead of Coachella to rehearse, and there was a lot of tension in the room. Grohl was disappointed that Hawkins hadn't seen him play with Queens of the Stone Age, while Taylor was still reeling from his overdose. A fight would erupt between the bandmates, and the pair vowed that Coachella would be their final gig together. The Back and Forth documentary outlined how the gig at Coachella went really well, and Hawkins felt that Grohl seemed like a new frontman. Afterwards, Dave and Taylor talked about going back to Grohl's home in Virginia and re-recording the album. The recording sessions would go a lot smoother, and their fourth album, One by One, would be a huge success going platinum in America, peaking at number three on the Billboard charts, and producing two massive hits in All My Life and Times Like These. It was around this time that Hawkins appeared to have turned his life around, exercising more, eating healthier, and giving up smoking, while also getting married to his wife Allison. In 2005, he would start the side project, The Coattail Riders, that provided a sharp contrast to his life in Foo Fighters, who were now playing arenas and headlining major festivals. Hawkins didn't stop at just one side project, as he also started playing in other bands including Birds of Satan and NHC with several members of Jane's Addiction, and was in a cover band named Chevy Metal. NHC bassist Chris Chaney would tell Rolling Stone, he never wanted to sit home and chill, he always had a purpose when he got up in the morning. He wanted to start a new group, write a song, or go play in a cover band, he just had to create. By the end of the 2010s, Foo Fighters members were now in their 50s, and their schedule showed no signs of slowing. It wasn't until the pandemic in 2020 that the members got some downtime, and by the summer of 2021, as life seemed to return more or less back to normal, the Foos would head back out onto the road. But Hawkins would tell his close friends, according to Rolling Stone, he had some reservations about touring so much. 2021 saw the band promote their new album, Medicine at Midnight, while also releasing their first theatrical film, Studio 666. An anonymous friend of Hawkins would tell Rolling Stone, Taylor knew he didn't have it in him, and he was trying to deliver. In late 2021, Foo Fighters played a handful of gigs in Las Vegas, Fresno, and Sacramento, and they were scheduled to head over to the Middle East to play at the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix in December. But the gig was cancelled after Hawkins collapsed on the band's plane during a stopover in Chicago. A close friend of Hawkins, Chad Smith, drummer for the Red Hot Chili Peppers, would tell Rolling Stone, that was one of the straws that broke the camel's back. After that, he had a real important heart-to-heart -heart with Dave and management. He said, I can't continue on the schedule, and so I have to figure out something. This is where we get into the game of he said, she said. Following the publication of Rolling Stone's article on Taylor Hawkins' final days, Foo Fighters management put out a statement claiming Hawkins did not collapse on the plane and that there was never a heart-to-heart -heart with management or Grohl about the band's touring schedule. In fact, Chad Smith and Matt Cameron, who were interviewed for the article, had to distance themselves from the piece once it was published, so make of it what you will. In late 2021, Hawkins' former drum tech named Yeti, who was still close with the drummer, would tell the magazine he was looking anorexic there for a while. Right before they left for South America this year, he told me, Man Yeti, you'd be so proud of me. I got a trainer, I'm doing things right, I've gained 15 pounds already, I'm getting things back on track. He was definitely stressed out over the last couple of years because he's definitely showing it in his weight. In February of this year, Hawkins would celebrate his 50th birthday. A few weeks later, the Foos would travel down to Mexico and South America for what would be their final tour with Hawkins. The drummer's final show with the band would take place on March 20th in Argentina at the Lollapalooza Festival. It was during this gig Grohl told the crowd about Hawkins, he's the best effing drummer in the world, with Hawkins responding, I effing love Dave Grohl man, I'd be delivering pizzas if it wasn't for effing Dave Grohl. Foo Fighters' next gig in Paraguay would be cancelled due to inclement weather. The band would then move on to Bogota, Colombia, where they were supposed to headline a festival on March 25th. According to those close to him, including producer Andrew Watt, Hawkins was in a good mood. Watt was speaking with Hawkins about working with Ozzy on his next album, and on March 25th, the day of the Columbia show, Foo Fighters were staying at the Four Seasons Hotel when Hawkins placed a call to the front desk complaining of chest pains. Paramedics would arrive at 7.40 p.m., and Hawkins was announced dead at the scene. The authorities in Columbia released a preliminary autopsy report claiming that he had several substances in his body, including pot, antidepressants, benzos, opiates, and that the drummer seemed to have an enlarged heart. Following the news of Hawkins' death, the band announced the cancellation of all their upcoming shows, and tributes would pour in from his friends and fellow musicians. A few days after the news hit, the band returned to LA and were captured by paparazzi at the airport, meeting their longtime manager John Silva. Those close to Hawkins expressed shock and disbelief in the news. Whether Foo Fighters will continue without Hawkins remains to be seen, but the band this month is performing two tribute shows to honor their fallen friend. 
As to whether we'll hear any new material from Hawkins, friend and producer Andrew Watt would reveal that the drummer left behind a lot of unreleased music. Whether that's just for his side projects or Foo Fighters, it still isn't fully clear. Let's just take this time to enjoy these tribute shows and see what lies ahead for the band in the future. That does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching, be sure to like button and subscribe, we'll see you again in Rock and Roll True Story Sticker.